Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That's So Po, and today I'm here with my husband, Sush. Hello. And we are going to be talking about the novelette category in the Hugo Awards this year. So we have already done a video where we talked about the novellas that have been nominated, so I will link that below, as well as just our playlist about the Hugos in general. And this time we're going to be talking about the six finalists in the novelette categories. Now, because novelettes are so short, um, if you're somebody who wants to go and read them without any sort of spoiler, I will link them down below. Four of the novelettes are available to read for free online. Two of them you do have to buy. Um, but the other ones you can go ahead and read before you watch this. We aren't going to be going into a ton of depth and we're going to try to avoid spoilers, but just because they're so short, even talking about the premise sometimes can um, give away a lot of what the story is about. Okay, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and get started talking about each of the novelettes. We'll be going in order of my ranking rather than Sush's ranking. Um, we do have some differences in some of the novelettes and what we thought about them and how we ranked them. But we'll go from the sort of lowest of my rankings up to my top ranking. And we'll talk about kind of what we thought, what themes we noticed, what our impressions were, and why we ranked them the way that we did with Sush explaining any differences in his ranking versus mine. And I would say that there isn't that much difference. It's like maybe one or two positions away. Okay, so starting with the lowest ranked novelette on the list for me is The Art Chronology of Love by Caroline M. Yaohim. This is a story which is set in a future, um, and there are a group of scientists who are trying to figure out what happened to a colony of humans on New Mars. One of these scientists is an archaeologist, which means that she can go into this special thing that they have, the archaeology. It's basically um, almost like a history, a record of what happened in the past. So she can go into that and view different scenes in the past, although there are some consequences where going in destroys that part of the record. And they're trying to uncover what happened on New Mars because the entire colony was killed due to some sort of virus or something that happened. They're trying to uncover that um, so that they know what happened and they can move forward. Unfortunately, her husband was one of the colonists and she's dealing with a lot of grief and that is interfering with her ability to focus on what the mission is versus using that our chronology to go and view old versions of her husband and have that connection. So there are a lot of really interesting themes in this story. I think that grief is one of the big themes. The scientist is dealing with so much grief, it's really overpowering her. This loss of her husband is new, she was deeply in love with her husband, and she's finding it very, very hard to process that grief. Um, another big theme in this is that of professional ethics. So she has a duty as a scientist and as one of this team to figure out what happened on New Mars, to understand what led to all of these deaths, but she finds herself in an ethical quandary where she wants to use her visits into this R chronology into this record to find these traces of her husband because she misses him so deeply even though she knows she should be prioritizing trying to find out information about what caused all, all of the deaths. There's also a big theme about unintended consequences, about um, actions being taken without us fully understanding how that's going to impact and hurt other people. Uh, this happens with the way that the scientist uses the our chronology, this record, because she will destroy parts of the record simply by viewing it. It also happens in just kind of understanding the way that the colonists were interacting with what was going on in New Mars. So I really do like these themes, but I did not enjoy the way that they were explored in this story. Um, even though I feel like these are the sorts of themes that I look for in my sci-fi, I was so frustrated with the way that they were handled in this story. I got really angry at the characters and all of the decisions that were made because I felt like this was approached kind of the exact opposite of the way that I wanted it handled. So for example, there's grief. Grief is a really interesting topic, but in this story, 
it's almost celebrating um, wallowing in grief where that's seen as almost um, like a poetic version of love to just be so overwhelmed with grief that you can't do anything else, you can't think straight, and that you put that grief above everything else. And it's one thing for a character to have that kind of experience, but it's another thing when I feel like the story is endorsing that behavior, when the story is saying, yes, you know, wallowing in your grief and letting it overwhelm you and other people enabling your grief, these are good things. This is a sign of love. And I just don't feel like that's healthy. I feel like I want my stories to talk about grief, but also to talk about healthy ways of processing it rather than valorizing, kind of um, sinking into it. So, so that upset me. And then the question of ethics was, oh, I just got so upset about this because at every turn when there's an ethical quandary, and there are many in here that are discussed, it's not just um, the scientist's decisions, but as other people's decisions around her, at every point, it's actually brought up like, oh, this is a difficult ethical question, or I kind of want to do this thing, but that goes against my professional ethics. And every single time that happens, the choice is to do the thing that is unprofessional, to prioritize kind of her own personal needs and wants um, at the expense of professional ethics, at the expense of the greater good. and that is also uh, accepted and endorsed by other people close to her. And just that feeling of these are scientists, they should have strong professional ethics, but at every point, um, those are, are broken. And that was very frustrating for me. Additionally, um, this idea of unintended consequences, it was really interesting to read this after having recently for the novellas read To Be Taught a Fortunate where To Be Taught a Fortunate by Becky Chambers is all about um, how a group of scientists is extremely aware of their impact and is very, very cautious um, with every choice that they make and not wanting to uh, overstep their bounds or ignore how they could be harming others that are different from them. And in this story, it's sort of like Again, the message is the opposite of what I'm looking for, where the message is, well, I guess we're going to never really understand others, so we're just going to hurt them with unintended consequences. Oops. And that just was not, it did not work for me. So. And kind of going on that, I, that really, uh, I felt that a lot. Um, I think there was this notion of, we've always done this this way, we've done this in archaeology, so this is no different, too bad. And that just frustrated me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we read all of these stories out loud to each other, um, and it was just very obvious as we were reading through this that both of us had issues with kind of the messaging and the ethics. So overall, I definitely had some issues with this story. I do think that it was reasonable in terms of writing style and voice and atmosphere and world building and characters. These were all reasonable, if not outstanding but I just struggled so much with the messaging, so I gave it two and a half out of five stars. Next up, we have A Wave of the Wolves by Sarah Gailey. And this is a story that first appeared, I believe, in Uncanny Magazine issue number 30, which was titled Disabled People Destroy Fantasy. And, uh, and basically, uh, the protagonist in the story is a, a, a werewolf who spends most of her time in human form but every so often transforms into wolf form. Um, in her human form, she feels, uh, she deals with chronic pain and in her wolf form, she feels uh, free and clear and that sort of a thing. So what happens over there is that, uh, you know, every so often things catch up with her and she feels the need to, uh, uh, you know, go into wolf form. Um, and uh, after she transforms back, uh, she's typically uh, helped by one of her close friends and uh, basically the people in the village seem to know that she is uh, a werewolf and uh, different people deal with that in different ways. Uh, her close friend is the only one that accepts her. Many other people uh, deal with her with uh, pity. Uh, some of them basically uh, uh, feel annoyance and there's this notion that a couple of chickens go missing each time and so people are dealing with it in different ways. 
and and basically what happens is and uh, the protagonist struggles with all of this in a sense where she has this notion of uh, basically pain when she's in a human form but she has this feeling of guilt and mismatch and things like that that she's kind of dealing with for needing to transform to a wolf. Uh, there is also a lot of internalization of a lot of these, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, messages and treatments that you see. In terms of themes, I mean, the, it's fairly straightforward. This one deals with disabilities. And the question is how it deals with disabilities. Um, and I think the idea is uh, one of the themes that it really touches upon that I think is an important one uh, is basically the difference between an impairment and a disability, uh, where you can be impaired and that can be a physical thing, whereas the disability is the mismatch between you and the environment, when the environment is not set up to be able to enable you to do normal things. Um, and so that mismatch basically causes friction. And so there is some amount of highlighting of that. And I think that's a really good thing. Then the notion of the transformation to the wolf itself, uh, initially I saw it as escapism and uh, I think maybe there is still a part of that. And I was wondering if there was, there's even uh, uh, things of, you know, um, uh, addiction associated with that, but I think that was not the case. And I think uh, later on, Shannon pointed out to me a different view. Uh, and I think that is actually probably, uh, uh, and that of taking meds, which I think is probably much more accurate to what the book is trying to be about. Um, and there's also a notion that is kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, explored, which is this notion that it uh, uh, in the wolf form, she is not someone else. She is still herself. The notion of identity is definitely also tackled there. Um, and there's also an important theme over here of the different ways in which people react to her uh, with some of some people acting with annoyance, some people acting with pity and others acting with acceptance. And in terms of impressions, I have to say that at first the character didn't really work for me and it was a put off. Um, I felt that she was um, kind of like um, uh, self-critical. She was also kind of like not really uh, there was a lot of angst associated with it and things like that. And, and so there was that. But then as time went on, I think my reaction slowly moved to pity. And that's when I kind of saw this notion of myself transforming from annoyance to pity. And I didn't like that about myself. And I wanted to move to acceptance, but could not find myself doing that. And so, you know, I, I didn't like what that said about myself, but that is a personal thing. And, and there's also some aspects of the resolution, which I think there's like one or two sentences which painted things in a different light. I won't go into that because I feel like that's spoilery, um, which didn't work for me. And, uh, and basically it's kind of this notion of, um, um, no, you know what? I won't go into that. Okay. Um, and then I think there's also one more thing which kind of I, I took from this, which is I came back to uh, a statement that I've heard uh, you know, about people with disabilities. And uh, that is a statement by Dr. Stephen Shore, which says, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And what, which means you really can't generalize based on the experiences of one person that, you know, other people should feel that way. And it's really about the shoulds. And so from that perspective, I felt a little guilty about judging the main character that way. Um, and I think this winds up being a deeply personal story uh, and I did not enjoy the reading experience of it, but I think that is not the point. Uh, I think I still like the story. It gave me a lot to kind of uh, reflect on. Um, I did not enjoy the reading experience, but again, that's not the point. Yeah, so I really struggled with this as well for exactly the reason that Sush mentioned, where this is a very personal story. So Sarah Gailey has said that this is a personal story about their own experiences with chronic pain. And as such, it is valid. It is valid as an exploration of their experience, as an exploration of how to think about and how to process ways to cope with pain management. 
And I think that as somebody myself who does not deal with chronic pain, I'm really hesitant to uh, rate this or rank this, but because this is nominated for the Hugos, um, I am giving it a rating and I am giving it a ranking. And that has to be based on sort of my interactions with the text, which unfortunately, kind of like with Sush, it, it didn't work so well. Um, I think that based on the things that I have read um, about just different ways of thinking about disability, I think that I am much more drawn to stories that are a lot about empowerment of people and a lot about um, people with disabilities who are the center of their story and who have autonomy and who are in charge of their choices. And there was a lot in this story where even if the story from Sarah, Sarah Gailey's perspective was a story of their own empowerment, for me, I read it in a slightly different way where it still seemed so much that um, the werewolf character was trying to please others um, at all points rather than making decisions that were best for the werewolf. And, and that was just so frustrating to read and it made me really rather uncomfortable. Um, I, I just felt very uncomfortable with the way that that played out. Also, I think that uh, this story very much felt like an allegory. It felt like um, a story that was really using a thin veneer of this fantasy story to tell a very personal experience for Sarah Gailey, which is totally acceptable, but it just wasn't something that I was able to fully connect with. It didn't feel um, fully fleshed out in the way that I wanted a story to be fleshed out. So it just wasn't my favorite reading experience. And, and I do feel very conflicted over that because I think that this could be a really powerful story for a lot of people. It just, it didn't work for me. So I ended up giving this two and a half out of five stars. So the next story is Emergency Skin by N.K. Jemisin. This story takes place in a far future where there is a group of elite humans who left Earth because it was sort of falling into collapse, ecological disaster, overpopulation, these sorts of things. And they went and they founded a colony sort of with all of the, the best of the best. Um, and we're many, many, many generations down the line, and they decide to send a warrior back to the previous Earth to collect some sort of raw materials from that to help them with things. Um, and this warrior is given an AI system inside of its head to kind of help it handle things. Um, and the warrior is promised that upon return to the colony, they will be given a lot of privileges and resources and things like that. However, when the warrior arrives on Earth, which it has been told will be, you know, completely destroyed, all these sorts of things, they find that actually there are still humans living there and not just living there, but thriving. Um, and that the earth has very much healed and become a little bit of a utopia. Uh, and this really causes a lot of cognitive dissonance because it goes against everything that they've been taught and everything that the AI that is in their head uh, has been telling them and continues to tell them. So there's a lot of conflict there. So this story does some really, really interesting themes. Um, it talks about so many ideas related to the way that we conceptualize systems in our future. So one of them is talking about elitism. So the colony is all about elitism. The colony is all about a, a very hierarchical caste system where those who are the smartest, the brightest, the most talented, these sorts of things, um, get all of the benefits, all the privileges, all the rights, and those who are of lower castes um, are not automatically granted those. They have to work for them. This is contrasted with the humans that are on Earth who have created a very egalitarian society. And relatedly is the issue of access to resources. In the colony, only those who are the most elite, who have the most privileges and rights, have access to resources, even resources that I think uh, we now in modern day would consider very much just natural human rights that you shouldn't give based on privilege. 
Whereas in the earth that the warrior goes to, everything is freely given. Resources are completely distributed. Everybody has equal access. Everyone has equal rights. And so that contrast is done. Uh, I think that in general, this book is looking at a version of utopianism. So looking at what does utopia look like? Um, in the colonies version of utopia, utopia is all about uh, survival of the fittest. Whereas in the version of Earth that we see, utopia is all about making room and space for everyone and making sure that everyone has these kind of access and uh, rights and just the ability to thrive. And so it really contrasts these two viewpoints and these two systems. And in general, this story is asking us to think about how we imagine the future. What kinds of future can we imagine? What does it look like if we think about systems where we follow that logical extreme of merit-based um, deserving of, of resources and rights versus kind of the true equality version of giving everybody equal access and accepting everyone and allowing everyone to be themselves um, no matter their age race gender disability anything just everybody being accepted and so it's a very uh, extreme version of this kind of equality and so I think that I, I really think that this story does a lot of um, questioning of our ideas and our imagination in a way that is very relevant to what's going on in the world right now because there's a lot of systemic issues that people are questioning how can we build better systems and some of this is related to our ability to imagine different systems um, I've heard in Jiri at Onyx Pages who I will link below talk about this about how science fiction can in many ways be used to imagine new systems to imagine new ways of doing things and right now with a lot of what's going on with the um, efforts to defund police. I think we're actually seeing that right now where there's a lot of people who are questioning, but what would a future without police even look like? And it's that issue of imagination where sometimes science fiction can step in and say, here's an idea. Here's a way that we can imagine a future that is different from the systems that we have. And I, I think that's just very, very much got its you know, hand on the pulse of what's going on in the real world. So I loved that sort of activism about it. I loved the way that it questions systems of control and systems of rights and power and resources. So all of that was really, really interesting. And I really loved also the way that it just explored this question, this what if, you know, what if there was a society, uh, this, this colony, which based things only on merit? Um, or at least definitions of merit. Um, and what if there was a society that didn't, where it said everybody was equal, and it just kind of takes those to the logical extremes. And I love that exploration, that kind of world building. Um, I thought that those were just really, really powerful parts of the story. I think that also the story is very unique in the voice that it uses because it does use a second uh, person narrative. And N.K. Jemisin has done this before in her Broken Earth uh, trilogy, but I haven't seen too many other authors do it. And this use of the second person narrative is very intriguing. It's told from the perspective of the AI talking to you, you being that warrior. And that's a very interesting way to do the story. However, there are some drawbacks <laughs> to that way of storytelling. Um, I think that in part because the AI is part of this colony, there is so much hatred and vitriol in what the AI says. It really represents sort of the most um, bigoted views of humanity. And that is hard to read. It's, it's very, um, very rage filled and, and very nasty in a lot of ways. So that's a little hard to read. Uh, additionally, I think because of the style of the way that the story is told, you don't necessarily feel very connected to the warrior. You feel more connected to the AI, which is very uncomfortable. And you don't necessarily just feel fully engaged in the story in the way that I think some other um, novelettes and things that look at what ifs can do. So there's like that kind of distance that I felt. However, I also wonder if part of that is me being, you know, a white woman and just part of the system. And if somebody who was experiencing a lot of the oppression of this system would just connect super strongly to the rage that is felt in this. 
So there's a lot of things in this that I thought were really, really powerful and a couple of things that didn't quite connect to me. And I think for me, um, um, essentially that last point is what caused a kind of disconnect for me for the story. It didn't really work because uh, I really, I think I have a bias towards characters I can connect to. And essentially I could not find that here. Um, and I found the characters to be a little obvious, even, I mean, in the extremism, if that makes sense. And, and therefore not having very much depth. And so that kind of uh, reduced my enjoyment of this. Um, and so it didn't work for me as much. Um, I definitely agree with a lot of the thing about the world building in terms of taking that what if to an extreme conclusion. Uh, I think that was neat. Yeah. But I, I agree. I, I don't know that there's necessarily nuance in the characters or the portrayal. It's much more making a political statement than it is um, building characters with a lot of complexities that you relate to. It's much more telling um, a political view. And so I think this could really work for some people, but for other people, not as much. I got a lot out of it, so I gave it four and a half out of five stars. Next up, we have The Blur in the Corner of Your Eye by Sarah Pinsker. And basically, um, this was a really neat book uh, about uh, an author, uh, Zana, who does this thing where uh, she, uh, she does all the scaffolding and preparation and research, and then she goes into the wilderness to actually do the writing. And she is a murder mystery author and uh, basically uh, the story follows her latest foray out into the woods and she has this uh, assistant who is uh, super on top of everything and prepares everything for her that sort of thing and uh, leaves her in this uh, cabin which is you know disconnected from the rest of the world and then things unfold from there uh, there are events that occur that kind of trigger her author brain and she kind of filed, finds herself in the middle of a mystery. Um, in terms of themes, I would say that uh, the main theme is kind of one of recursion of when an author finds themselves in a story mm -hmm. of the type of story that they would write. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of neat. But I think otherwise, this book for me was not one about the themes as much as it was about the delivery. The characters are phenomenally, uh, phenomenally written. Uh, the environment has this low-key horror mystery vibe going for it. And uh, basically it just sucks you in immediately and, it's, and you're just turning pages as you go along. Um, I absolutely love this book. Uh, I don't have that much to discuss about it really. It was just a thoroughly enjoyable read. Uh, maybe the only thing that I would say is that this is a book that uh, reads like a really good mystery for me in that um, it kind of leads you into trying to puzzle out what it is that is happening and then basically delights in proving you wrong and mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. going along that. Yeah, I'm, I'm always impressed by Sarah Pinsker. I, every time we have read one of her stories, and we've read one for I think the past three Hugo Awards, I have loved it. I, I really like her writing. I really like what she has um, done in her writing, the way that she characterizes people and the way that her stories flow, especially because I think she's able to do something which I absolutely love, which is she surprises me. Um, often I find that with things like mysteries, either it doesn't really make sense or it was so obvious from the beginning. Sarah Pinsker is one of the few people who I think can write a story where she leads you along and you are seeing the pieces, you're understanding, you just don't know what to make of them. And like so she said, sometimes she leads you down these kind of garden paths where you start to think like, oh, this is what it is, and that's not what it is. But then the turn that it takes also makes sense. It's still compelling. Yes, it's still compelling, it's still logical, and it's like, oh, that's why. Mm -hmm. And it's just so much fun to read. I absolutely adored this story. It was so good. It really made me want to just go out and pick up other works by Sarah Pinsker. I know she has a novel out. I just want to go read her things because this was so, so, so enjoyable. I gave it five out of five stars and I, I really loved this, even though it's not my 
top choice for the Hugh Girls, I'd be totally happy if this one won. Next is For He Can Creep by Siobhan Carroll. So this is such a cute story. It is told from the perspective of Jeffrey, who is a cat. And he is very much a cat. He has got the personality of a cat. He is living with his human, uh, who is in a psychiatric hospital. Um, this takes place, I'm feeling, probably in either the 18th or 19th century. Um, and his human is a poet. Uh, Jeffrey is doing his thing um, in the hospital, but often we'll see little imps and demons and things that he'll attack it because he's a great hunter and, you know, he's able to defeat them. Except that one day the devil comes and the devil wants his human to write a poem that would give the devil a lot of power. But Jeffrey is the protector and kind of in the way, so the devil tries to tempt Jeffrey um, to get him to step out of the way. So this story was just absolutely adorable, so much fun. It has some interesting themes in it, although like the previous story, the themes are maybe not what make this story um, so extremely strong in my impressions, um, but the themes are still good. So some of the themes in this, for example, are that of um, arrogance, so Jeffrey, being a cat, is extremely arrogant. There's so much of the story which is about his arrogance, his belief that he is vastly superior and he is the center of everyone's attentions and he is the greatest hunter and can defeat anything. So there's a lot about that arrogance in the story. There's also a lot about selfishness and about temptation because the devil is trying to convince Jeffrey to sort of step away and there's a lot of things that the devil does just as the devil does in many stories to tempt Jeffrey and there's a lot of parts of Jeffrey which are spoken to by that temptation. And then really at the heart of this the biggest theme is that of loyalty and friendship. Um, there is definitely the loyalty that Jeffrey feels for his human. There is this sense of protectiveness, the sense of wanting to be there and to, to take care of his human, but there's also a lot of friendship in this with um, the other cats. Uh, there's some other cats in this story who are just as arrogant, but there's a, a real bond of friendship and loyalty both from Jeffrey to his human and from the other cats to Jeffrey, and that is just gorgeous. So I think that this story, what really, really makes it stand out more so than the themes is the voice. This story was so, so beautiful in the voice. We absolutely loved it. It was so much fun um, to have this kind of read aloud because Jeffrey's voice is just so great. It's so strong and you feel his emotions, you feel his arrogance as a cat, and it, he feels like a cat, what you would imagine a cat would sound like. And it's just um, adorable and arrogant and hilarious. There's so much humor in this story. And I think it just, it really was beautiful and fantastical, but also just so heartwarming. I think that if you want a story that's going to make you laugh and make you feel good and just be such a fun ride, this story is definitely, definitely it. And I think the other cats also have distinct cat personalities and it's really done well. Um, and it's also funny when, you know, uh, you talked about arrogance and uh, it just it was really fun watching the interplay between the devil trying to tempt uh, Jeffrey and the vanity of the devil going against the <laughs> arrogance of the cat. And every so often the devil's like, all right, I'm dealing with a cat, kind of a, you know, <laughs> the, the, the interplay is beautiful across the board. Yeah, so this was also a five out of five star read for me. I really, really, really loved it. And I just, even if you read nothing else on this list, this one can brighten your day. So I, it's free and I recommend you check out the link. And finally, there's Omphalos uh, by Ted Chang, which appears in the short story collection called Exhalation. Uh, I actually have done a standalone review for Exhalation, so if you're interested in hearing about um, not just this story, but some of the other stories in that as well, I will link that down below. And I think this is an interesting uh, story, 
and it's difficult to talk about what the story is about and instead I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I noticed in it. Um, this is a story set in a world where there is overwhelming uh, evidence of the creationist myth. Okay, And so uh, from that perspective then, uh, science takes a very different kind of, a, 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 what do you say, role uh, where uh, there is still science but in a sense uh, science is showing people how it is that things work and therefore you can marvel in God's work because God is clearly the person who has set this in motion. So, and for anybody who does not know, who isn't familiar, mm -hmm. the creationist myth says that um, God created the universe and the world um, in 6000 BC. And so that's when everything started on Earth. Um, and so in this story, there's all of the scientific evidence that basically history goes back and geology and everything goes back until 6000 BC and then it stops and everything was just created, fully formed at that point. Yep. And so basically you have that kind of a world and then so science has a very different role. And in a sense, you have uh, faith which says, uh, revel in God's love, etc., etc., whereas science says, this is how God works. Okay, and so there's that distinction in that kind of a thing. So it's kind of interesting where the whole science versus faith thing has a different mm -hmm. uh, view in such a world. And it also means that certain other terms like secular are defined differently in this mm -hmm. term, in this world. And so a lot of the word terminologies that we have in our world translate really neatly into this world mm -hmm. in a sense. So I found that uh, kind of a really nice thing. And so now the question is, in the face of, I mean, in, in a world where basically you have such a, a clear, uh, what do you say, signal that God exists and created everything and whatnot, what then could constitute a crisis of faith? Okay, And I think that is, uh, for me, what this book comes around trying to explore. Um, and in a sense, the central theme of the book is a search for purpose mm -hmm. and the book says as much but the word purpose means very very different things for very i mean for different people and it sets up all of these people and then kind of shows us their uh what do you say parts in that and uh, and also in a sense this for me behaved as kind of like uh, an opposite of the story of your life Mm -hmm. um, uh, which the movie Arrival is based on, also by Ted Chiang. And it's from the previous Ted Chiang collection, Stories of Your Life and Others, which I also have a review of, mm -hmm. so I'll link that. Um, I'm not going to go into why I think this is the opposite. I think you should read the story. I, I think that thing can get spoilery. Um, and then there's also, in terms of themes and symbolism and things like that, the name Omphalos. Um, I found out after reading the story, I went and looked it up, uh, apparently means navel or center and essentially this is worked in in symbolism in oh, yeah. many different places. I mean right at the beginning one of the pieces of evidences that are introduced is a notion of proto-humans that were very well preserved uh, mummies essentially uh, who had no navel and this is one of the things of uh, evidences of God's creation because these cre uh, these proto-humans were created fully formed. They did not go through the per uh, process of gestation and birth and things like that. So why would they have a belly button? You know, that sort of a thing. Uh, but then also it deals with the center and that comes back to purpose saying what is the purpose of creation? What is the center? Why did God create? Mm -hmm. And essentially that uh, is also wind, uh, winds up being explored a little bit. And so that, that's something that's really fascinating. Uh, what the story also did really well for me is so much background world building mm -hmm. and uh, even little things like so for example uh, certain affairs being held uh, what do you say handled privately okay which I think speaks to a lot of uh, what do you say religious communities for example and I think that's also a very subtle but scathing uh, kind of uh, uh, criticism of that mm -hmm. sort of a, a behavior in a sense but how that makes perfect sense as, from a, what do you say, how this kind of world would work kind of basis. Um, for me, I love this book. I think I'm still digesting it as with many of Ted Chiang's works. 
I really need to sit with this and I think I need to read it again. Um, but I absolutely enjoyed it. It's still kind of lots of things that are like, oh, that was what that was about or mm -hmm. uh, that could have meant this and you know mm -hmm. that sort of a thing so. yeah I, I think it's really interesting to have for me this was a reread of this story and I was so glad that I reread it because I got a, got a lot more out of it the second time even I mean it just really really moved me and I think that that's the thing with Ted Chang where a lot of his stories have so much nuance and so many layers and so much complexity but done in a way that um, it's very accessible in that you can read it and fully enjoy the story, but then you go back and you reread it and then there's more layers uncovered and more layers uncovered and more depth and it's just gorgeous. And I think that what's really fascinating, especially to read this now with along with the contrast of the other stories, is that I found that um, this story contrasted for me with like the M.K. Jemisin story because the M.K. Jemisin story also explored a what if in a way that I think a lot of Ted Chiang stories do, um, where it says in this one, you know, what if God really did create the world, you know, 8,000 years ago. Um, but whereas N.K. Jemisin's story was sort of in your face and it was all like just the message, so much of this one is subtle and it's nuanced and you're really drawn into the story. You're drawn into the journey of the character. You're drawn into the main character's um, experience. Uh, the character that we're following here is an archaeologist and so um, she's very involved in, in a lot of things that are going on in the scientific community. And it's just like I was so attached to her as a person and to her journey and to what was going on and you know this uh, everything that she was feeling i felt so deeply and so i was just really blown away by the craft it's such a fascinating question and such a fascinating premise um and it that's all done within a story that is just absolutely beautiful to read and so emotionally moving and i think that um, especially given that Sush and i are not religious you know it was one of those questions of how much is this kind of question that's very much about religion and faith going to speak to us but I think it just was it, it kind of went beyond so many of those levels and just was very thought-provoking. I will admit to having had a few concerns in like the first couple of pages of reading this book about okay am I going to be able to connect to this character what's going on kind of a thing and where is this going to go? Um, I, I think that those yeah. concerns were not founded. Yeah, so I gave this five out of five stars. Um, I just, I really think that Ted Chang is a master of, of short works. He's so fantastic at world building, at exploring these ideas, and at creating these beautiful stories. So I, I really, really loved this story. Okay, so that wraps up our ranking of the Hugo Novelette finalists for 2020. Um, if anybody else has read any of these, please let me know what you thought in the comments down below. I'd love to hear if you ranked things differently or if there were any other thoughts or impressions you had. Again, um, four of these stories are available for free, so those are linked down below. Uh, and they're just, uh, it's a lot of fun to read these stories, so I'd love to hear, especially I think if you have any differences of opinion, that's very fascinating to hear. So I'd love to know um, what you thought. And yes, thank you for watching. And we will soon get to the short stories and the novels um, because those are the remaining two categories that we have to do for the Hugo Awards. So I'll be hosting those in the next month.